Welcome, friends, to a special internet-only broadcast of The Line of Fire. As uh, uh, yesterday, the same thing has happened. The radio studio that feeds our radio stations across the country uh, is still evacuated due to a chemical problem in a fertilizer place nearby. Hopefully, tomorrow we'll be back on radio, but it doesn't affect all of you watching on YouTube and Facebook, but here's what we're going to do. I've got very targeted material today. We're going to get in-depth on some very controversial subjects about charismania, about the alleged NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, about my participation in a documentary for American Gospel TV, uh, and about the stances I've taken for many, many years now on abuses within the charismatic movement and abuses within what I would call hypercriticism. Because we can't take calls today. What you can do is this. If you have a relevant question or comment, not just a general Bible theology question, a relevant question or comment, you can post it where you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. And hopefully, because I got a lot of ground to cover, hopefully I'll have time to respond to some of your comments and questions along the way. So go ahead and do that on YouTube or on Facebook. If you want to stand with us and help us in the work that we're doing, there's a donation button on Facebook, and there's a dollar sign at the bottom of the chat box on YouTube. You can stand with us there. We always appreciate it. It helps us reach more people. And those that are watching, but you're at Twitter, if you have a relevant comment or question, you can post it there, and I'll see if I can respond to some of those as well. Okay. Um, the American Gospel video has been watched perhaps millions of times, and many have been really helped by it as it exposes some of the deficiencies in the American Gospel, as it exposes the abuses of the prosperity, the hyper uh, carnal prosperity message, as it exposes some aspects of charismania. Uh, many have been helped by that. Many have been angered or hurt because they feel that things go too far, that good people are attacked and maligned. Uh, but I imagine the, fr from those who've been helped, it's, it's, you know, that's how they see it. Uh, in any case, I got an email from the producer of American Gospel. Uh, the email came last November, and, and I want to read, uh, it, you know, there's a personal background and interaction, but I want to read the relevant portions of this. This was sent to me by Brandon Kimber, November 2nd, 2021, and he knows that I'm sharing this publicly. So this is, this is all good. He said, I'm currently working on a third film in the American Gospel series on the topic of the true person and work of the Holy Spirit and the new apostolic reformation. I know that you have spoken about these issues, often critiquing the critics of Noah. So I wanted to reach out to you to see if you would be interested in participating in a video interview for this docu-series. I know that since we disagree on certain issues, trust is likely a big concern for you. The way I often address this trust issue is to offer you the ability to view how you are edited in the series before you sign your appearance release. Legally, I cannot use your image without your approval, so there's really no risk. In my film, Christ Crucified, I interviewed a few progressives and a secular humanist that I disagreed with. I offered them the same deal, and they all ended up signing up their releases without any changes. There's no doubt that I will want to ask you some tough questions, but I'll be happy to provide those beforehand. I'm willing to travel to you to film the interview. Sometimes I also hire a shooter and conduct the interview remotely over Zoom, etc. My goal is to, it says great, I believe, typo for create, an honest and balanced film, and I think your participation is a step toward making that a reality. I do not intend to approach this topic for a cessationist continuous divide, I intend to bring both groups together in our common critique of certain hyper-charismatic teachings and practices that are commonly connected to those who believe in the modern-day offices of apostle or, um, and prophet. All right? Now, there are places where I've dot, dot, dot. That's where he was providing links and other things like that. This is the full context of what he wrote. We interacted, went back and forth. I had some concerns based on the questions he asked, which he explained he was asking on behalf of the critics. So he wrote back to me, this is January 6th, 2022. 
My goal is not to make this film become a strange fire 2.0. He said, I want more charismatic perspectives to be heard from someone in the continuationist group. And then he said this, and you are one of the few people that, uh, who respond to charismatic critics. I will do my best to allow you to present your understanding of Scripture clearly, but that will not com- completely eliminate my bias. I have interviewed people like Justin Peters, Chris Roseborough, Phil Johnson, etc., which is why I'm asking questions that sound like they're coming from people like them. All right, so that was uh, Brandon's interaction with me. We filmed on January 24th. Uh, it was supposed to be 90 minutes. We ended up going four hours. Now, that's on me. I, I gave lengthier answers to questions than may have been expected. So he, he's got a lot of editing to do on that. Uh, I really like Brandon. I believe he's very sincere. I believe his motives are what he says they are. And, and I, I trust him to edit fairly. Now, I know that there'll be things said by others that I'll profoundly differ with, but if a door is open to me, I I have done this in circles that some call uh, hyper-charismatic, and I've done this in circles that some would call hypercritical. If the door is open to me for me to get my message out without me being personally compromised, I'll do it. There are some settings that are so wrong and compromising that I've had to tell them. I will speak against you if you have me on. I I will be, in other words, what you want me to be part of, I cannot be, and I'll speak against. But if a door opens to me and I, excuse me, can freely get my message out, I'll do it. Uh, um, So if you're going to tell me I shouldn't be on certain TV shows because you think they're hyper charismatic, well, then I shouldn't be on these videos or with, I've been on shows with some that you call hypercritics. And, and and anyway, if the door's open, I'll do my best to go and get the message out. Okay, so Brandon then uh, posts this on uh, – he took a picture of us together, right? And then he posted this on his Facebook page. And he said, we're asking for your prayers today for today's AG, American Gospel 3 interview with Dr. Michael Brown. Like AG2, we're interviewing people we disagree with with the hope of asking challenging questions and calling to repentance. And that was Brandon's sincere perspective. In other words, he's not being duplicitous. I told him I was shocked to read that. I said, that's completely contrary to what you you emailed me. What you emailed me is what I just read you. Nothing about calling me to repentance. So I, I fully understood he wanted my perspective, as so many differed with, to present that on the video, right? Here's this perspective. Here's this perspective. Now, perspective A may be Brandon's, and he may have 10 people from that perspective, and maybe two people from mine, but it's to present it so people can see for themselves, just like when I call for a debate. When I'm asked to go to a college campus and speak on a controversial subject, well, I'll often say, can you get someone on the other side to debate me? And this way, they can hear both sides present it and make up their own minds. So I, I asked him about it, and again, in his heart, and asking me the hard questions, He wanted to change my mind on things. I I had no clue about that. No clue whatsoever. But in his sincerity, that was his perspective. So again, you know what was written to me and why I agreed to be on. So in any case, because of his integrity, he wanted to explain further. And I I pointed out to him, I, I said, look, one of the issues is this critical spirit is destructive. And just look in the comments coming in. I'm getting called a heretic. I'm getting called a false prophet. I'm getting called this. Look at the ugliness. Look at the how vile it is, and the mocking. That's why I've had to block people, like my Twitter account. Uh, I I blocked Justin Peters. It it wasn't so much what he posted, although I I took issue to what he posted and and strongly differed with it, but the flood of stuff that would follow, the ugliness of it, the maligning of the the vile comments towards this, which which I told him, and this this is public discussion. I'm not revealing a secret here. So Brandon then immediately updated Uh, the next day and said, yesterday's interview with Dr. Michael Brown went well. Thank you for your prayers. The goal of the interview was to present Dr. Brown with some challenging questions concerning certain hyper-charismatic doctrine and practices with the goal of getting him to change his mind in light of scripture. Again, as I told him, I didn't have the slightest clue he was trying to get me to change my mind. I was simply stating what I believe for decades as clearly and 
and, and, and forthrightly as I could, the issues I have, the things I agree and affirm, et cetera. But in any case, th that was his heart. That's, th he felt he was doing that. So again, I trust him as sincere. I believe he's a very sincere young man. Um, he said, this is what we meant by, quote, calling to repentance. And now he says this, we want to clarify that we do not think Dr. Brown is a wolf or heretic, like some of the comments have suggested. Well, in point of fact, some of the people that will be on the documentary think that very thing about me. I, I just feel bad for them. I mean, I'm enjoying the blessing of God. I'm enjoying the favor of the Lord. And by God's grace, we, we've gotten to serve and help millions of people around the world. And, and, and every day we get people writing to us and thank us. It's all to the glory of God. Any, any good, trust me, I know myself, any good that comes out of my life or ministry is all by the grace of God and all to the glory of God, right? All clear on that? But I, I'm good. I'm, I'm blessed. I feel bad for those that I want to serve and be a blessing to and then only think I'm saved. And then they spread that to others. It's like, wow, I could really be a blessing in your life and I have material that would help you and edify you. But they, they cut me off. That grieves me. And then it, it does not contribute to the unity of the body based on truth. It, it contributes to disunity and division and suspicion and, and a, a, a destructive, critical, mocking spirit. That's what grieves me because I love the body. And, and I know Jesus prays for our unity. Yes, based on truth. So Brandon, to his credit, clearly says he does not believe I'm a wolf or a heretic. Uh, he, he said that he believes about me. He believes a biblical gospel. Please watch his debate with Brian Zahn on penal substitution. We do agree on quite a few things including the abuses of the prosperity gospel, but there are still some remaining disagreements, especially in the areas of our understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit and how we are to associate with teachers or prophets who may be deceived or deceiving others, reference to 2 Timothy 3.13. A final takeaway from our interaction is the necessity of practicing loving and truthful discernment and how to distinguish between first-tier essential gospel error, heresy, and second-tier errors, which can still hurt people, but do not put someone outside the camp of Christianity. So he posted that because of ugly comments coming in, because of his integrity, wanting to honor the Lord and not wanting to cultivate hatred, anger, mockery. So, so that's his heart. And I, I pray for the, the fullness of God's blessing to flood his life and the fullness of truth as, as I pray for critics, as I pray for myself. Now, one thing that's interesting is, yeah, so first tier heresy would be, you deny Jesus is the only way to God. You deny the deity of Jesus. You, you deny the efficacy of the blood of Christ. You deny the inspiration of scripture. That disqualifies you from being a believer, from being a, a true Christian. Uh, on the other hand, if you deny the gifts and power of the spirit for today, that's a very serious error. It, it, as I understand scripture, that's a significant error and a significant misunderstanding of what God's doing among hundreds of millions of people on the earth today. But it doesn't disqualify you from salvation. In, in the same way, you may, uh, you may believe in some charismatic extreme that's really dangerous, but it, it still doesn't disqualify you from being a believer. Uh, so he, this is important to him. And then he has a scripture, you know, from 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. Uh, and, and it's about how the servant of the Lord should con conduct himself to help people uh, come to freedom get set free if they've been ensnared by the devil. Okay, so I'm, I've got a stack of, of some of my books here because I, I, I want to help you understand who I am if you don't know me well and set the record straight on something. Um, one of the primary attacks that comes against our work today, and I'm not saying this to defend myself, again, by God's grace, we, we know the fruit that we're bearing and those that we've helped in almost 50 years of ministry, and it's to the glory of God, and it's humbling, and, and we rejoice in that. Uh, but many have criticized me that I just look the other way with charismatic abuses, that I sanction every false teacher out there, and I look the other way with charismatic abuses. Now, it's again, it's sad to hear people say that. and I, I, I grieve for them. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm blessed. But it, it's so the opposite of who I've been and what my calling is, because the, the very first message I, I preached in, in uh, 1973, August 21st, at the age of 18, was the repentance message. And whatever setting you put me in, it's, it's, I, I'm always searching my heart and calling repentance to call us nearer. So I'm just going to give you a, a little selection here, okay? 
I'll start with End of the American Gospel Enterprise. Came out in 1989. It's it's a call for repentance with a promise of revival if we do repent, and it's primarily addressing my own camp, which is Pentecostal charismatic. So here's the first quote, 1989. This is the great indictment against our spirit-filled congregations. We have had the fanfare without the fire, the hype without the happening. With all our boasts, with all our noise, with all our big talk, we are a generation that has experienced precious little of the fullness of God. This was the first popular book that I wrote, first book on revival. And this is a quote from it. Here's another quote from End of the American Gospel Enterprise, 1989. Our funds have been spent on our own edification and our energies devoted to build up our lives. We are stuffed with new revelation and gorged with the hottest new truth. Yet instead of getting healthy, we're fat. Instead of getting stronger, we're stale. We are specialists in praise and worship and experts on interpretive dance. Apostles and prophets are again in our midst and word teachers fill our whole land. But the old time power is missing and divine visitation is rare. The blessing of God is departing and we are left with a great big gain. Our ship has set sail, its decks are all full, but the wind of the spirit has waned. Would you say that's pretty forthright? Would you say that's pretty clear as someone who affirms the gifts and power of the spirit today saying something is very wrong and something is missing? Okay, 1990, how saved are we? Yes, it's in general to the Church of America, but I'm traveling primarily in Pentecostal charismatic circles, and that's why I have a whole chapter on the carnal prosperity gospel. So here's a quote from that chapter. All right. This is How Saved Are We, 1990. The book of Proverbs says that there are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, land which is never satisfied with water, and fire which never says enough, Proverbs 30, 15, and 16. Today, we can add one more, the materialistic American church. We are like the two daughters of the leech who cry, give, give, Proverbs 30, 15. We never have enough. This is what has happened to our modern day prosperity gospel. It has run aground on the shallow shores of greed and ambition. It has capsized in the turbulent waters of selfishness. It has sunk under the weight of covetous hearts. May it never sail again. I continue. How could we be so blind? We have encouraged people to want to get rich. We have told them that it is all right to be eager for money. We have taught carnally minded believers who have not died to the world to pursue worldly wealth. And we try to make the whole thing so spiritual as if the reason God exists is to meet all our wants. Some even teach, you can have whatever you say, so just speak it out all the time. A swimming pool, a giant screen TV, a mink stole. The Lord wants you to have an abundant life. And how many of us are trapped? We have taken our eyes off Jesus and put them on earthly treasures. The deceitfulness of wealth has tricked us again. It has stolen eternity from our hearts. Some of us have even become fools we have stored up things for ourselves, but are not rich toward God. Luke 12, 20, and 21. Again, that's how saved are we. This is the, the new cover on it. The old cover looks different. 1990. Now listen, I don't need to repeat this every day to hold to this, right? When, when you write things this strongly in books and then reiterate them over the years, you don't need to repeat this every day, nor is my calling to watch Christian TV and every week, call out this carnal prosperity preacher or look for all the books published and call this out. That's, that's not what God has called me to do. And my life is quite busy just doing all we're doing. Okay, then 1991, I wrote the book, Whatever Happened to the Power of God, subtitle, Is the Charismatic Church Slain in the Spirit or Down for the Count? Pretty direct title, would you say? Pretty direct subtitle. Then in 1993, it's time to rock the boat, a time to rise up and preach, a call to rise up and preach a confrontational gospel. So the first book, totally directed towards Charismatic Pentecostal Church. Second book, largely directed there, republished as two books together. Okay, so here are some quotes from whatever happened to the power of God. In fact, I'll, I'll bring you one choice quote. Is the Charismatic Church a modern-day Samson? Let us examine our souls before God. He knows the real heart of our leaders. He knows how much complacency has crept in. He knows how low we must go until we come to the very end of ourselves. 
This much is sure. The charismatic church, just like Samson, the way to restoration is humiliation. The way to victory is death. So meaning we would go through a big crucifixion and real purging until we came out repentant, humble, and freshly filled with the Spirit. All right. Time for Holy Fire is the current title, but the book became most famous as From Holy Laughter to Holy Fire, America on the Edge of Revival. First edition came out in 1995, three months before the Brownsville Revival began. The closing words of the book are, are you ready? I knew that something was right at the door. And, and at this same time, 1995, I wrote this poem called Slobbering in the Spirit, which I would sometimes recite publicly. Yes, it is a sarcastic poem. So I wrote this in 1995, shortly before Brownsville, all right? which indicates to you as I was a leader in Brownsville that Brownsville was anything but this. Brownsville was the opposite of this as a Jesus-exalting, repentance-based move. So here is slobbering in the spirit. <clears throat> We're getting drunk on God's new wine, and everything is mighty fine. So come along, relax, don't fear it. Now we're slobbering in the spirit, growling, roaring, barking too. It's all part of the Holy Ghost Zoo. Some do froth and foam and drool. Getting zapped is mighty cool. Of course, we know there's more than this, but for now we're deep in bliss. So don't urge us to reach the lost or pay the price and count the cost. Don't mention that bad word called hell or that God's holy. Please don't tell. Don't talk to us about sacrifice. Everything is just too nice. Business at the bar is great. Everyone is drinking late. So join the party. Gulp it down. The real thing has come to town. Now, I've never been in my entire life in a service where people were growling and barking and roaring. I've, I've, I've never been to a service like that. But I know they've existed. Okay? I know things like that have taken place. And this was obviously a parody and a sarcastic rebuke. This is who I am. This is, this is who I've always been. Nothing's changed with that. And if, if I was with a group of people acting like this, I would publicly correct them on the spot. All right? And if there was no place for me to do it, I'd walk out the door, and then I'd reach out privately and say this was wrong, and I would talk about it publicly as well. <clears throat> so I, I've been doing this all these years. Okay, if you read Authentic Fire, which is my response to Pastor John MacArthur's Strange Fire. In here, I acknowledge issues and errors in the charismatic Pentecostal movement. Now, by the way, if God had placed me in the Southern Baptists or if God had placed me among born-again Presbyterians or Lutherans, I'm sure I'd be bringing a message of repentance there. And, 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 and God would be using me to, to show issues there that, that needed attention. And again, always examining my own life first. In... Um, 2000, let's get the exact date on this one. Um, and, and, and during these intervening years, from, from the late 90s into the you know, 2010s, 15s, I was not writing book after book after book about the power of the Spirit, moving in the Spirit, and flowing in the Spirit. I was writing answering Jewish objections to Jesus and commentaries, you know, Jeremiah and, and, and Job and, and other things like that. Uh, then Hyper Grace came out. Let's just see. Was it 2014? And, and anyway, somewhere around there. Um, Hypergrace, exposing the dangers of the modern grace message. This was not primarily addressing Calvinists. No, no, th this was primarily addressing, with names and quotes, abuses in the charismatic movement with hypergrace. So this is another whole book addressing issues. You see the pile's getting pretty big here. And then 2018, playing with holy fire. A, a wake-up call to the Pentecostal Charismatic Church. May I read the table of contents to you? This is 2018, all right? 2018. First, I explain how the Spirit's moving mightily around the earth. That's chapter one, the Spirit is moving mightily. Chapter two, why are we so gullible? Chapter three, mercenary prophets. Chapter four, superstar leaders. Chapter five, abusive leadership. Chapter six, unaccountable prophecy. Chapter seven, sexual, excuse me, Sexual Immorality, Chapter 8, The Pep Talk, Prosperity Gospel, Chapter 9, Celebrating Doctrinal Deviance, Chapter 10, 
to the third heaven and back in a flash. Chapter 11, wanting to be wise like the world. Chapter 12, where do we go from here? And then a postscript, a loving word to the charismatic critics. So I, I believe I can say with a fair degree of certainty that as a known charismatic Pentecostal leader, that I have addressed abuses in our movement more regularly and more loudly than maybe any other known, well-known Pentecostal charismatic leader. All right. So I, I, I've been forthright about this as loudly and clearly as I can. Not to, I am not God's policeman. I am not the corrector in chief. If you watch this, listen to this broadcast regularly, I'm always encouraging and seeking to build up and bring life. But where there are issues for the good of the body, the health of the body, we have to address them. You also know, if you're a regular listener or viewer, I don't spend all my time attacking the critics. You know, constantly there are new videos being put up, excuse me, of this and that, new websites, new articles. Sometimes people send me the link. Sometimes I accidentally discover it. I'm looking for something on YouTube and it pops up. I'm not here bashing these guys and attacking, and I, I pray for God's best for them. I pray for a spirit of truth. Sometimes I laugh out loud when I see something just completely false, and they seem to believe it's true, and, and then I grieve because of the disunity that it causes in the body. But that's not what we're here to do, have an ongoing battle. And the other day I discovered that different critics are now putting out videos attacking each other. It's like they're in a... a, a, a a shooting circle that's, that, you know, just shooting one another within a circle. That this one's a hypocrite. Yeah, they attack Michael Brown like this, and that's right because he's a heretic, but then they excuse heretics in their own midst. It's like, whoa, this, this is what happens, though. You, you reproduce after your own kind. That, that's grievous because there are right things that some of these brothers do expose and some of these sisters do expose. But the way it's done ends up in so many cases doing more harm than good. And again, that's, that grieves me because I, I love the body and I want to see everyone receive from each other, everyone that's sound receive from each other and grow in God. Here's one quote from Playing With Holy Fire. Nowadays, people claim to whiz back and forth to the third heaven just as easily as they send a text message or place an order at a fast food drive through With a snap of your fingers, you're there. And a few moments later, you're back. Oddly enough, this experience doesn't seem to affect our modern-day travelers the way it affected Paul. He wouldn't talk about it. They share quite freely without the slightest constraint. So it, it start with playing with holy fire and, and see the issues that I've raised. And there are books where I name names and give specific quotes and books where I talk about issues, just like in the New Testament. Paul talks about false apostles, for example, 2 Corinthians 11, and, and says they're servants of Satan, but he doesn't mention their names. All right, And then other times he calls people out by name. Peter mentions false teachers, but doesn't mention names. So there are times to mention names. There are times to address the issues and, and different books, different things. Okay, so just in terms of some larger things I've done outside of books and just got massive distribution online, a few years back, a number of years back, um, Victoria Osteen had made some unfortunate comments that you know, just easily misunderstood or, have, or rightly understood were disturbing. And, and Joel Osteen had said certain things, so they were really getting attacked. So I, I wrote this. Uh, it is an appeal to Joel and Victoria Osteen. Uh, it was posted on Charisma News, probably some other sites. I believe it was shared maybe 400,000 times, okay? Loving, gracious, but an open appeal, all right? Or, or how, about, how about this one when, when Creflo Dollar was raising money for a $65 million jet? I wrote this article, uh, Why Creflo Won't Be Getting My Dollars. All right? Just coming against it. And I did it because this was now a story in the world, and it was bringing reproach to the gospel. So as a gospel minister, I wanted to say, hey, this is, this is not our message. This is not what we believe. And I was pleased to see some secular articles that were quoting this quoted me. In other words, here's another voice for the gospel saying, hey, no, this is not who we are. This is not who we are. All right. Then last year, I'm sorry, 2020, 
when COVID prophecies were coming out, it's going to end by April 15th. Uh, I wrote an article saying, okay, let's see. It's, it's supposed to diminish starting April 15th. I said, let's see. Let's see what happens. This is a great test. If you're right, you're right. We're all going to rejoice. If you're wrong, something's wrong here. And then a few days after April 15th, I said, right, there's still time to see what's going to pan out. But some things already are not panning out. I, I discovered last night critics saying, okay, Brown, you said you're going to call people out. Where are you calling them out? Well, I immediately began to say, hey, where is it? Question mark. I said, how come nobody warned us? How come none of these national prophetic voices told us it was coming? Call that out. And then began to talk about it on the radio. So if they were just looking for articles, I didn't write separate articles at that point, but I did talk about it on the radio. It was supposed to happen. Hasn't happened. So now, so, uh, now you get into 2021. And now you have the Trump prophecies. So I, I have been consistently calling this out. I began to call this out, say, okay, it's either yes or no. Either he, he, he's in the White House or not. All right, let's not come up with excuses and try to move the goalposts and things like this. So here's just, just one example, all right? Uh, some practical thoughts on contemporary prophetic ministry. That one dealt with uh, covid related issues to say, okay, how can some of these prophets read your mail and have incredible words from God for you? And they reduce you to tears. You're on your face weeping because of the presence of the Lord and, and, a, and a true word spoken. And they got COVID wrong. I said, well, they're out of their lane. God didn't tell them, just give us your opinion about what's going to happen with COVID. That, that wasn't their place for calling. In, in any case, you know, I addressed that immediately. And, and then here, a, a strong appeal to those who prophesied Trump's re-election. A strong appeal to those who prophesied Trump's re-election. I'm, I'm not going to get into that one now, but I have been calling this out steadily, steadily, steadily. I'm quoted in the New York Times as saying, this is the worst deception that I've seen at that time in 49 years in the Lord. I have a book coming out, God willing, in September on the political seduction of the church with two whole chapters on the failed prophecies the false prophecies and the failed prophecies. You make distinctions, but they're all wrong, okay? And I've played clips because things were so ugly. I tried to reach people privately without success. Others I didn't try to reach privately because I, I simply completely reject their ministries. I've played clips on the air of some of these people. Now, it was the right thing to do and the right thing to call for accountability and the right thing to say, this is serious error, all right? So that's who I am that's what I do, but not to please the critics because everyone comes to me with their list. All right, we want you to identify this one, this one, this one, this one as false teachers. They're literally, or they'll call in. We want you to identify this one, this one, this one, this one. For in general, if you just call and say, what's your opinion on this ministry, that ministry, that's not what we do on the air here. All right, so it's got to be an actual issue of concern, a teaching or you know, doctrine or practice or something, or is there immorality? So we're actually addressing issues, not just, if you call me and say, hey, what church do you recommend in this city? We, we don't do that, okay? That's, that's not what we're here to do. So when, when people come with their list, some of the people I totally differ with. I don't, I, I don't agree with their teaching. I don't like their ministry, but I'm not, it's, I'm not here to say, well, I like that one. Don't like that. This was a good one, bad one. That, that's not my calling. And, and I see nowhere in the word where someone presents you with lists and you go through the list, check them off. Some I know to be fine people, godly people, sound in doctrine. But if I will not say they're a false teacher and if they were to die right now, they're going to hell, then I'm a false teacher because I'm friends with them and I won't renounce them. Oh, and then hang on, Dr. James White, Calvinist, cessationist. Dr. James White is a heretic and false teacher because he works with me. It just, oh, God help us. It is so destructive. It is so unbiblical. And you can't tell me I'm being soft on issues when I'm confronting them day and night. But again, if I have an open door to get on a platform and get my message out without compromising myself, be it a, a, a charismatic channel or network that I don't agree with certain things on, but they're giving me a platform, John MacArthur was on TBN many years ago, and he didn't denounce them when he was on the air, right? He just got his message out. So same way, if a hypercritic asks me on their platform, but I can get my message out fairly, I'll, I'll do it. Gladly, in a, in a heartbeat. Here, 
This is not going to happen. Well, God, anything's possible with God, but I don't expect this to happen. If Master's Seminary, John MacArthur's school, seminary, called me and said, Dr. Brown, we'd like you to teach for a week on Jewish apologetics and we'll work it out around your radio show. Obviously, we only want you to teach on that and nothing else. In a heartbeat, if I could make it work with my schedule, it would be a privilege and honor in a heartbeat. So that's, those are the choices I make. You can differ with them. You can think I should be more narrow on both sides. That's, that's fine. Okay, one last thing. I, I just want to revisit the issue of, of so-called NAR. We, uh, by the way, we put out prophetic standards calling for accountability, saying there needs to be greater accountability. Other prophetic movements put out reiterated standards and said there were definitely errors and, and we need to avoid these in the future. So we're doing what we can to bring reform within the movement. I told the hypercritics, you should be cheering me on rather than blasting me because I'm not doing it the way that, that you feel it should be done. Okay, last thing, and then I'm going to respond to comments, questions, uh, if we can get to as many as we can. Okay. One of the things that came up, uh, and I've, I've just got to get this link up here for a second. Uh, okay, so one of, one of the things that came up in my interview with Brandon for the American Gospel uh, docuseries was that I passionately defend what I believe. I, I passionately stand for what I believe to be true, all right? So when I denar, deny the existence of NAR, denar the existence, when I deny the existence of NAR, this uh, alleged loose network of Pentecostal charismatic churches that believe in apostles and prophets today and share other characteristics, when I deny the existence of that which these critics describe, like, like, for example, Wretched Radio, that, it, you know, 360-something million people are under the influence of NAR, and it's a heretical teaching. What, when, when I deny that, it's because it doesn't exist. What I believe I stand for, I hold to. Do I believe there are apostles and prophets today? Yes, I, I believe they've been through church history, just not, not recognized as such. Yes, I, I believe they're here today, and, and I believe I know people. I, I believe my friend Yesu Padam. And in India is a genuine apostle. He doesn't use that title for himself, but I believe he's a genuine modern-day apostle. I, I, I believe that. But he ministers and leads how he, he He is who he is. If you think of him as a pastor or a missionary, whatever, that's, that's not the big issue. But if, if something was real, I'd talk about it. So let's just focus on this one thing. I am, according to many websites, and I'm sure there are a whole lot more out there than I've seen and have been sent to me because I don't go searching for this unless I'm researching for something like this. I'm allegedly one of the main leaders of NAR. Now, when I've met other alleged main leaders of NAR, you know their first question to me? What's NAR? What are you talking about? There is a movement that Peter Wagner uh, was leading called New, New Apostolic Reformation. All right, that's one thing. I, I was not part of that, all right? That's one thing. But this worldwide NAR, I'm telling you, as a Pentecostal charismatic insider that's traveled the world that knows top leaders around the world, it doesn't exist. So let, let's just put this to bed once and for all. For those who love integrity, let's put this to bed once and for all. Um, Holly Pivik and Doug Givett, who've written two serious books on the issue of NAR, this is how they define things, all right? The core NAR teaching is that the church must be governed by present-day apostles and prophets. They say that's the core. And in their view, it's a, it's a helpful designation. Now, I say it's unhelpful because it, it is known in critical circles around the world to mean something way beyond that that's very unhelpful and very destructive. In their view, it's, it's helpful, and they're trying to be sincere in their own work and definitely seeing abuses that need to be addressed, for sure, for sure. I do not believe that. In other words, this is not my personal view. I do not believe that the church must be governed by apostles and prophets. I do not believe that the church must be governed by apostles and prophets. How then am I one of the world leaders in NAR? Interestingly, I have not been accused in, in their books of being one of the world leaders in NAR. But according to the critics, I am. I don't believe that. That is not my practice. That is not my view. How then can I be a leader in this? All right, now we go to Chris Roseborough's Pirate Christian site. 
and Berean Examiner, the six hallmarks of a NAR church. The six hallmarks of a NAR church, June 7th, 2016. All right? I just want to clarify things for those who love truth. All right? And those that are going to believe what they believe, hey, God bless you. I want God's best for you. Not mad at you, but I want God's best for you. All right, six hallmarks of an art church. Number one, apostles. We're in a second apostolic age. There are new apostles on the, earth, on the earth today, anointed by the laying on of hands to represent and speak for God here on earth. These super apostles are equal to the original apostles, the ones who witnessed Jesus' life, death, resurrection, etc. Um, there is new apostles are commissioned by God. Their authority may not be questioned. I categorically reject that. Oh, now, I don't know anybody that personally practices that or holds to that. All right, maybe Chris does. Maybe there are people out there, right? Maybe there are people I know and they actually believe this. I have no clue about that. But that teaching that there are apostles on the earth today, like the original apostles with unquestioned authority, I categorically reject that as serious error. All right? Number two, kingdom. Rather than preach the gospel of the cross, apostolic leaders are working to bring the gospel of the kingdom of heaven to earth. It goes on from there. It expands on it, okay? So rather than preach the gospel of the cross, apostolic leaders are working to bring the gospel of the kingdom of heaven to earth. I categorically reject that. I preach the gospel of the cross. I believe we're called to be salt and light and make a positive impact on this fallen, sinful world while we are here. But I preach the gospel of the cross. I categorically reject that. That's the first two I categorically reject. I've done this in the past to help people, but doing it once more. Number three, destiny, presence, glory. Though members are not always charismatic, they frequently emphasize a manifestation of glory in God's presence and often have a special anointing to receive direct revelation from God, perform healings and other signs and wonders. They teach that our purpose is to achieve our dream destiny so that we can change the world. Well, I believe in healing and miracles for today. I believe in God's powerful presence and, and his, his glory being manifest in touching lives and changing them dramatically. Um, I believe our purpose is not to achieve our dream destiny, but to fulfill God's purpose as, as, as his slaves uh, and thereby to fulfill his mission for us. So I agree with part of that, but the way it's stated, I can't affirm all of it. All right, so that's three down, two I categorically reject, one I can't affirm as written. Four, revival. Revival on a massive scale is a key to this in this movement. The strong emphasis on an end times harvest through a great awakening that we can usher in Often these revivals are held in stadiums and reach millions around the world via live stream technology. They're marketed and produced like rock concerts. All scripture verses about an end times falling away are ignored and get replaced with hyped up claims about the next big thing that's always just around the corner. That's, that's a complete misstatement of what I believe about revival. So I reject that. I do believe in end time outp outpouring, according to the scripture. I would contend for revival in any generation in which I live, according to the scripture. Absolutely. Um, I Talk about falling away most recently yesterday. Uh, the people that I know that believe in end time outpouring also believe in end time falling away. So the people I work with don't agree with this either, but I don't agree with that as stated. Okay. That's four out of four so far. Two I categorically reject. One, I don't like some of the wording. One, I, I disagree with the way it's worded very strongly. Five, unity. At the expense of biblical doctrine is almost always used as both the how and the why in this movement. Unity for the sake of bringing heaven to earth is leading to the blurring of doctrinal denominational lines, often bringing together well-known leaders of charismatic reform, word of faith, secret emergent, progressive Roman Catholic churches all under one umbrella. Finally, in our churches almost always abandon a major tenet of Christian faith, which is the last one it's going to get to. So I, I read that prematurely. So unity, unity must be based on truth. I will work with anyone in the body that, that is a sincere believer for common good if I can, all right? But if the person is a heretic and denies fundamentals of the faith, I will not work with them other than to call them to repentance and to speak the truth to them or do a debate with them or something like that. Um, I have friends that much will work with a much minor group than I, but speaking personally, no, don't agree with that one. <clears throat> I agree with unity based on truth and strive for it, strive for it. Six. NAR denies the sufficiency of Scripture. NAR adherents may believe in the inerrancy and authority of the Bible, but God's breathed out word is just not enough for them. Jesus' sacrificial death for our sins is not good enough. The promise of eternal life in heaven is not good enough. I categorically reject that the way it's stated. 
Now, sufficiency of Scripture doesn't mean you don't have a relationship with God. Sufficiency of Scripture doesn't mean you don't pray. Sufficiency of Scripture doesn't mean you don't worship. Sufficiency of Scripture doesn't mean you don't have quality fellowship with the Lord, enjoy intimacy with the Lord, and, and His Spirit leads you and you hear His voice. Sufficiency of Scripture means the Bible is all that we need it to be and gives us all the fundamental revelation about who God is and how we are to live, and that we cannot add a syllable to the Bible. So, out of the six alleged descriptions of a NAR church, I, I don't know, personally, I don't know any church in the world, personally, I don't know any church in the world that would affirm all of those six tenets as written. Again, it, it's the shimmer of, of NAR. It's the, the, the wax nose of NAR that you shape into whatever you want and, and group all errors together and throw them in, into one. And as written, three of them I categorically deny. Two of them I strongly differ with the way it's written. One, I differ with part of what's written. So I'm, I'm not NAR. I am not NAR. I belong to an organization for fellowship purposes and friendship and co-working called International, uh, excuse me, not International, U.S. Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. It used to be led by Peter Wagner. I was not part of it. With all respect to Peter Wagner, I was not part of it. My friend Joe Matera took it over only when he could change the name from Apostles to Apostolic Leaders. And it's a wide range. It's, it's people in the business world. It's pastors. It's others that I would consider apostles. It's a wide range of people. And I do it for fellowship purposes, all right? And, and, and we have a lot of good common ground. But I don't know anyone in that group. I don't know everybody. I don't know anyone in that group that would affirm these six things. And this is all allegedly NAR. So let's deal with the errors where they exist. Let's deal with word of faith extremes. Let's deal with the carnal prophet, uh, pr uh, prosperity gospel, Let, as opposed to preaching that God provides for us so that we can be a blessing to this, this hurting and dying world. Let's address prophetic abuses. Let's address doctrinal weaknesses in the charismatic movement. Let's address carnal fundraising issues. Let, let's address all those things. Absolutely. I, I'm doing it. I'll keep doing it by God's grace. But let's, let's get rid of the myth of this worldwide NAR conspiracy. And, 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 and to, to those that so quickly damn someone to hell because of their friendship with someone or association, or because I won't go through the checklist and say, okay, this were all hell-bound false teachers. I'll say, hey, I disagree with what they teach. I think this is wrong, dangerous, but I don't know them. I can't say whether they're saved. You're not, oh, then you're not saved. God help us. That's, that's such a destructive mentality. God help us step higher. All right, let's see if we can grab, I'm, I'm going to look over on Twitter here and just see if anything has been posted that is directly relevant. Okay, let's just see. Uh, okay, because I didn't just say, hey, post questions. Normally, I have to do it more clearly in a separate post. Anything, guys, here on YouTube, uh, any questions that came up for me, uh, see if you can grab some things or comments that you think I should address. And let's just take a look over on Facebook. I'll do that. And again, with no radio, we had no commercial interruption and we had no breaks or anything like that. And, you know, I'll just be a little more casual looking some things up. Um, let's just see here. Kath, Catherine, is this only your opinion or what is the word of God said? Only thing that matters to me is, is what God says in his word and, and the practical fruit that comes out of it. That's how we look at things. If something is not explicit in scripture, you know, Jonathan Edwards was strong on that, the Great Awakening. You know, people falling, shaking, crying out, going into trances. He said, yeah, that could well be the Spirit, but it's not a proof of the Spirit. What you have to do is look at, is Jesus being exalted? The Jesus of the Bible, is he being exalted? You have to look at uh, whether people are coming under the authority of the Word of God and loving the Word, whether they're walking in the Spirit of truth, whether they're repenting, excuse me, repenting from sin, having a manifestation of love in their lives, love for the lost. That's how you judge it, all right? And, and, and he also said, we ought not to limit God where he hath not limited himself. In other words, it never says in the Bible, well, if you pray for someone, they'll fall, they won't fall. They'll shake, they won't shake. They'll weep, they won't weep. They'll jump, they won't jump. So that's not how you measure things. You measure based on doctrine and, and, and morality. That's, that's how you measure things. Um, yeah, let's just see here. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bethel and their controversial school? So, there have definitely been some abuses, some wrong things that have happened 
And as leaders have learned about them, they have addressed them. They have addressed them. Now, to some, it's a controversial school. To others, it's, it's a wonderful school. Um, I, owe, I only know Bill Johnson a little. I know Chris Valadin much better. And I, as far as I know, Chris is a God-fearing man who loves the word of God and who wants to see people ground it soundly. You know, when he heard about students or others that were going laying on graves to soak up the anointing, you know, from, from past dead saints, he, he po- posted a Facebook post immediately where he expressed his differences. Uh, when I asked Bill Johnson about it on the radio, and that's probably the long, that is the longest conversation we ever had was, was on the radio. And um, I asked him about it. Yeah, I said some people were doing it. And there's even a picture of his wife, you know, soaking in an anointing from some past writer because she was going to write a book. But he said, it's wrong. We don't practice it. It's contrary to scripture. And was very plain on that. Very, very plain on that. In fact, if you never listened to the interview with Bill Johnson, just search on YouTube or on AskDrBrown.org. Just search for Bill Johnson and you'll see it come up. And then just judge for yourself based on that. So there are definitely some practices, some things that have happened that we'd agree with our abuses and maybe some emphases that would be different than mine. But I understand the people there to, to be Jesus-loving people that want to win the lost and see the Lord glorified and have real compassion for the sick. Um, do you believe that apostles and prophets still have authority and a place in the church? They have authority, like pastors have authority, like evangelists have authority, like teachers have authority. I don't believe that they have a special authority. New Testament prophets do not have special governing authority where they can say, the Lord gave me this word, and therefore everyone has to submit to it. No. Any word that's given should be submitted to other prophets. In other words, if if there's a directive thing or something of importance, should be submitted to other prophets, and and then everyone must test that according to Scripture. So prophets do not have authority to say, thus saith the Lord, you have to do this and that. Apostles are, are, are pioneers, are foundation layers, are, are builders, are fathers. So uh, John Wesley, to me, was an apostle. Hudson Taylor with China Inland Mission. These men were apostles. They started movements. They weren't just pastors of local churches. I, I know people that started planting churches and then multiple churches, and then those churches planted churches, so they have this network of churches, and they're kind of the, everyone looks at them as the father of the movement. That person probably has an op- <laughs> excuse me, an apostolic calling uh, as opposed to just a pastoral calling. But I do not believe that every pastor has to have an apostle over them, that, that, that every that a, a apostle can come into a region and just tell people he has no relationship with, you have to do this, this, this. No, I don't see that at all. Um, Darren, where can we trace barking back to? Well, again, I've, I've never been in the service where I've seen it myself. Um, and someone that was in services night in, night out for years in Toronto, where it allegedly happened a lot, he said it's the rarest of, ever, of things that he ever saw anything like. He said he personally never did, but heard about it here and there. But in any case, I had heard about it from a, a pastor of the, of the Calvinist church that I went to from 77 to 82, barely charismatic, at the Cane Ridge Revival, that some of the, you know, these proud religious people would come in mocking this, you know, what, what God was doing in the revival. And, and next thing they'd be on their knees barking like dogs. And it was taken that either God was humbling them or they were getting delivered from demons. But I'm sure of this. And, and by the way, when people ask about it, I was in between classes and services and special teachings at Brownsville, thousands of meetings. And we never saw anything remotely close, within a million miles of what would be called people barking. People want to ask about, why do you ask about that? Thousands of people are being saved. Sinners are getting right with God. Lives are being transformed. Missionaries are being raised up, sent out. Families are being put together. Jesus is being glorified. People are weeping in his presence. And, and the word is being preached hour after hour after hour and meeting after meeting. I have no question that the word of God was preached and taught more in Brownsville Assembly of God during the revival every week than any hundred churches you could find thousand churches you could find. Why not rejoice in that? What about the barking? Well, the dogs on the street bark. That's the only barking I ever heard. Uh, let's see. Anything else here? Um, okay, let's go over to see if there are any other things posted on Facebook. All right, come on. 
all comments come up. All right, somehow it's this funny thing where I'm not seeing all comments. Guys, you spot anything else on Facebook to address? Uh, you can you can maybe pull it up for me. Uh, okay, personally, I stay away from anything nor. Does anyone remember Todd Bentley? Todd Bentley, here, li listen, listen. How about Southern Baptist leaders who have been exposed for sexual sin? There have been quite a few, hundreds of scandals in, in, in many churches represented, deacons and different things. It's, it's been terrible. So you're going to write off all Southern Baptists based on that? Is that what you're going to do? Because of the scandals sadly surrounding Ravi Zacharias at the end of his life and after he died, you're going to write off all apologists? We publicly rejected Todd Bentley's ministry over 12 years ago, okay? And then I was headed up a panel that evaluated his ministry and said he is never fit to lead a ministry again, even with full repentance, okay? So you have an extreme here. What's that got to do with, quote, NAR? There, there is, the NAR of the critics does not exist. Fact. Do many of the aberrations of which they speak exist? Yes. Are they somehow related under NAR? No. That is a fiction. Whether it is just a convenient way to smash and bash charismatic Pentecostal extremes, whether some truly believe in its existence, as certainly Doug and Holly do, God knows. God knows why people are using it. But I, I just read descriptions of what NAR allegedly is. I don't know anyone that holds to all those. That's the issue. Um, let's see, anything else? Yeah, so, so here, this is typical, typical. Todd Bentley, fringe, okay? Rejected for years, deplatformed. There were churches after his divorcing his wife, adulterous affair, divorcing his wife, remarriage. Churches used to preach in hundreds and hundreds, cut him off, would never have him after that, okay, because of their integrity. So you have someone with some extreme, okay, let's, I'm going to start citing here. Do you quote Martin Luther? Well, Martin Luther said things far more extreme and crazy and ugly than Todd Bentley. So what does that mean? So does that mean all Lutherans are wrong or leaders today that respect Martin Luther, you write all them off? I, I don't understand. I, I'm, I'm making an appeal here in love, okay, in love. What's the use of listing the abuses of a discredited minister with maybe a tiny following now, and may he really come to repentance and, and wholeness in the Lord? What's the use of doing that? He, and now that proves NAR is, I, I, honestly, I don't get it. And I, I do this to help. John, it would be helpful to actually see contemporary concrete issues being addressed in video form. Would it be a possibility for Dr. Brown? John, I've done that uh, on the show, and we've pulled some of those things. But I, I, I am not here to satisfy critics, and I'm not saying that's your position. So we have to concentrate on what we believe the Lord wants us to talk about on the air. So we spent a lot of time on the Trump prophecies and, and false prophecy and serious error with that. We spent a lot of time on it. We addressed it quite a few times, openly written about it, quite a few articles. I've got two chapters in a book coming up, but we got, we got video on that in the show. Um, if there's another major issue that comes up, we feel to address, we do. But the main purpose of this broadcast is not to address Pentecostal charismatic error. I could say to the hypercritics, where are all your outreach videos reaching the lost? I'm active in missions day and night. We have missionaries we've raised up, sent out around the world. I'm active in Jewish evangelism day and night. I'm going to evaluate your entire ministry based on that. And they'd say, well, others are doing that. Our, our concentration is, is discerning. And, okay, well, you be faithful to your calling, and I hope you do it well, uh, and I'll be faithful to mine. But we, we have addressed issues, and then you know, dig in. I've written whole books, whole books as well. Um, Alex. Oh, would you please source the Jonathan Edwards writings you mentioned on the Holy Spirit? Thank you. So the, um, the, there's, a, there's a, an excerpt of quotes I have. If you go to askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, and just type in Edwards, you'll get some excerpts from some of his writings. Um, but the, 
the the main book, and I'm just going to grab this here for a second. Uh, in in time for holy fire or from holy life to holy fire, whichever edition you have, uh, you will you will find there. Uh, let me just go to the right place. You will find there a, a chapter on uh, the proof of the revival is in the living. And in, in that chapter, I go through the nine non-signs that Edwards gave. In other words, he said, these do not prove that the work is from the Holy Spirit. Even though it could be logical, it doesn't prove that the work is from the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's, it's from one of his famous books that I believe he wrote in 1741 because of all the critics of the Great Awakening. I have, no, I have no question in my mind whatsoever that if some of the critics of contemporary revival, critics of the Brownsville revival were alive during the Great Awakening, they would have been critics of Jonathan Edwards. I don't question it for a split second because many of the same things are being criticized. And, and here, here's something that, that does concern me. Okay, where is this coming up? Here we go. Here's something that does concern me. Um, John 5, Jesus heals a man crippled for 38 years, right? And then he says, take up your mat and walk. And it was the Sabbath. So you weren't supposed to carry based on a strict interpretation of Jewish law. The religious leaders see the man crippled for 38 years walking with his mat. What would have been your reaction if you were them? <gasps> You're healed. Well, praise God. What, how, did, how are you healed? This is a miracle. Oh, by the way, you shouldn't carry that mat. Put it down. But You're healed. What happened? That'd be the right reaction if you thought it was wrong to, to carry on the Sabbath, based on Jeremiah 17. You know what their reaction was? Who told you to carry your mat? Why are you carrying a mat? That's the issue that I have. Jesus heals a man born blind in John 9. Oh, how would you like that if we, if we start doing that in our services? Here's someone blind. Hey, give me some dirt from outside there. Okay. And a spit in the dirt, put it on the blind person's eyes. Say, okay, go... Um, yeah, a few blocks down there, there's a there's like a, a public fountain there. Go go uh, wash your eyes off, and 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 you'll see. Oh, that that'd be very popular. So what happens? Jesus does it, and the man's healed. The man is healed. Whoa! What a miracle! What do the religious leaders say? Wait, wait! You were healed on Sabbath, and, and this that, that's not right. That's not legal. That can't be God. So God, God does this all the time. Pentecost, tongues of fire, foreign languages, half the crowd or whatever the numbers were, part of the crowd, they hear the praises of God in their, other, in their own language. The other part, you're drunk. These guys are drunk. That's the way it's going to happen, friends. So Jonathan Edwards in 1741 wrote a book on this, and I condense it in uh, chapter 13 from Holy Life, God, Holy Fire. The proof of the revival is in the living. And let's just see if I have here the specific title of the Edwards book. And then we're going to have to close things up. We've, we've gone uh, over time today. Yeah, Distinguishing Marks of Revival. And um, yeah, it's, it's a fuller title than that. In fact, I'm just, I'm just going to type this out here. I'm going to type in Jonathan Edwards. Yeah, I, I just... The exact title escapes me for a split second. Yeah, the full title was The Distinguishing Marks of a Work of the Spirit of God, subtitle, applied to that uncommon operation that has lately appeared on the minds of many of the people of this land with a particular consideration of the extraordinary circumstances with, this, with which this work is attended. So a lot of unusual things are happening. So he wrote a book to say this is how we can really tell what is God and what is not. All right, with that, friends, we are out of time. But if you have friends that have these kinds of questions, many sincere people, many who've been hurt in charismatic Pentecostal circles because of abuses. Oh, I, know, I know people get hurt in all kinds of circles and churches and, and their abuses and issues. I understand that. But wherever I, you know, I'm, I'm more in tune with those things that happen in circles where I've traveled for years and therefore we're grieved over that, maybe this will be helpful for them to see. And, uh, and let's pray. You know, Brandon is, is working on this docu-series and let's just pray that as people listen to the different voices, which I believe he'll, he'll present fairly, 
that Jesus will be glorified, that people will find truth, that will embrace the fullness of the Spirit. As, as Brandon said to me, we both want to see a Christ-centered revival. Let it be, and, and let a multitude be transformed for the glory of God. God bless you.